Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Good morning. I want to thank you all very much for coming to this winter border crossing conference here at the Divinity School. I'm Daniel Sack, the administrator of the Border Crossing Project. Um, as many of you probably know, the Divinity School has people pursuing a variety of vocations, um, principally including teaching and ministry. And the Border Crossing Project is investigating how those vocations intersect and diverge in interesting ways. One of the intersections is the practice of prophecy. Prophecy being the ways in which people attack idolatry and call people back to faithfulness, drawing on their traditions. Ministers and preachers often both find themselves in the position of doing prophet prophetic work, sometimes even without seeking it. Prophets of many traditions and ages have drawn on their traditions texts to speak to their society's concerns. That task, that interpretive task, is often challenging, however, in a society like ours that is complex with a variety of languages and texts and audiences. Today's conference is an investigation of this hermeneutical question. How can preachers, teachers, ethicists, and other public commentators interpret ancient words for our modern time? We've had a planning committee working of faculty, students, and local clergy putting together a program that attempts to answer that question, and we hope that it is useful for the variety of audiences both in the Divinity School and in the larger community. We have a panel of scholars and clergy reflecting on how their vocations might be prophetic and what that means. We have a discussion of how an author might have seen her work as prophetic. There'll be opportunities for you to think about your own work as a prophetic interpreter, including informal discussion over food and drink. We're starting our work together today, however, with an investigation on the prophetic role as understood in scripture. Our investigator is Ellen Davis, the Amos Reagan Kearns Distinguished Professor of Bible and Practical Theology at Duke Divinity School. Dr. Davis's research focuses on how biblical interpretation bears in the life of faith communities and their response to urgent public issues, particularly envi environmental crises and interfaith relations. Her most recent book, Scripture, Culture, and Agriculture, an, ag an agrarian reading of the Bible, integrates biblical studies with a critique of industrial agriculture and food production. She's long been involved in interreligious dialogue and is now cooperating with the Episcopal Church of Sudan to develop theological education, community health, and sustainable agriculture. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Davis. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. This is, in fact, my first visit to this very estimable university. Uh, so. The title of the conference, The Prophetic Interpreter, is subtle, suggestive. I would expect nothing less from the University of Chicago. Um, and as I pondered it, I began to think it may fill in a gap in my own theological vocabulary. I do not belong to a part of the church that identifies our contemporaries as prophets. There certainly are many parts of the church that do, but my own, the Anglican Communion, for the most part, does not do so. But, but prophetic interpreter this seems to me to be a way of thinking about our roles in the church that might be broadly applicable to contemporary ministry and probably essential to contemporary ministry. It's also a notion that has deep roots in scripture. Presumably the prophetic interpreter is someone who has the gift of reading scripture in a way that speaks to us now, that comforts us, convicts us, not just as individuals, 
but also as a culture. One of my students suggested a couple of weeks ago that the first instance of such a prophetic performance within the Bible itself may be that of Hulda, the woman prophet who lived near the palace in Jerusalem in the reign of Josiah, so the seventh century before the Common Era. And as you may recall from the story in Kings, when a Torah scroll is found in the process of repairing the temple, Josiah sends to Hulda for an interpretation of the text. And she reads and says, it will happen to this place, Jerusalem, it will happen to this place exactly as it is written in this scroll, because you have abandoned me to worship other gods. That is an instance of what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called reading scripture against ourselves. And Bonhoeffer said we are all too much in the habit of reading scripture for ourselves, but not enough in the habit of reading it against ourselves as Hulda does against Judah. My own contribution today is, and I should warn you, it's not an expert statement. It is an early exploration of what it might mean to interpret scripture and our contemporary situation from a prophetic perspective. In fact, it's only quite recently, perhaps a year or a little bit more, that I have begun to realize how prominent, maybe pervasive, is the role and perspective of the prophet in the Bible. It's literally, the Christian Bible I'm speaking about, it literally runs from Genesis to Revelation. Abraham is once called a prophet, and at the opposite end of the Christian Bible, Revelation sets the whole world in prophetic perspective, as Brian Blunt particularly has reminded us in his new commentary. The prophetic role, the prophetic perspective, is held up, maybe not in every single book between Genesis and Revelation, but certainly in very, very many of them. What I'm going to do now is identify four or five aspects of the prophetic perspective that are widely represented in the Bible and seem important in the context of our various 21st century ministries. I've given you the first page of this handout, which is inside your um, folder, is, um, it pertains to this lecture, and I've just outlined the five of them and a little bit of bibliography uh, along with it for you. Um, these five that I'm identifying here, this is very unsystematic, it's not meant to be an exhaustive characterization of a prophetic perspective, but I do think that these several elements cover a lot of ground, and they may also give some, shall we say, texture, dimensionality, to what I would take to be the default biblical understanding of the role of the prophet, namely as a bearer of the divine word and a mediator of divine power. So, the first element of a prophetic perspective that I would, in a sense, build upon that base understanding is the radical concreteness of prophetic expression. Prophets do not traffic in general ideas, universal ideals. They are not um, offering dispassionate ruminations. Rather, they deal in vivid images, emotions, including God's emotions. They speak of particular landscapes, Israel, Babylon, Jerusalem. They speak identify particular characteristics of individuals or of a people, a nation. They speak of immediate and identifiable political situations. This radical concreteness is connected to the scholarly observation that has been prominent at least since the, 19th, the 18th century, 
that the prophets, the biblical prophets, are poets. Robert Loth, professor of poetry at Oxford in the mid-18th century, may have been the first to notice, certainly to state explicitly, that Isaiah and other writing prophets are writing poetry. This is a quite influential discovery, and one indication of the influence is if you look at the King James Bible published before Loth, and you look at any 20th or 21st century Bible, and you will see that in the King James, the prophetic books are written as prose. They're set as prose paragraphs. In our Bibles, Isaiah, for instance, is almost entirely set as poetic lines. A very key term in Loth's discussion of poetry is the sublime. Isaiah is for him the ultimate example of the sublime. And he identifies sublimity as the quality of language that, quote, strikes and overpowers the mind, that excites the passions, end quote. This quality is akin to what I am calling radical concreteness. Sublime language is language that hits the ground and hits us at the same time. Biblical poetry is involved language. It involves both the poet and the reader. You might say it implicates us. Listen to the opening verses of the book of Isaiah. Listen, heavens, and give ear, earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children I have reared and brought up, and now they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, and the ass the trough of its owner, but Israel does not know. My people do not discern. Alas, sinful nation, a people weighed down by iniquity, seed of evildoers, children who destroy. Surely we are meant to feel thoroughly implicated in this address to the sinful nation. Poetry is involved language. When Loth, Robert Loth says that biblical poetry is sublime, he is not referring to fancy language, ethereal topics. Sublime language can be plain, earthy. Isaiah and the other prophets write poetry about farmers, for instance, chapter 28. And when Isaiah writes about we might think the most ethereal topic of all, God. When Isaiah speaks about God, it is in concrete language. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and uplifted. First verse of chapter 6. Isaiah is citing a particular year, 733, the year King Uzziah died. Indirectly, he is evoking a particular set of historical and political circumstances that scholars call the Assyrian crisis. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. It's as though I were to say, in the year of Watergate, I saw the Lord. So what else is getting concretized in Isaiah's vision of the Lord? Sitting on a throne high and uplifted, and the hem of his robe fills the temple. And the flaming creatures are standing, he's using present participles here, the flaming creatures are standing at attendance on him, each with six wings. With two, it covers its face, and with two, it covers its lower parts, and with two, it flies. And each calls to the other, saying, holy, 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 and so on. Now, this is a vision with surround sound. 
In fact, as one of my students pointed out, Isaiah's vision account engages every one of our five senses, even down to the hot burning coal thrust under Isaiah's nose. My main point here is that the concreteness of prophetic expression does not mean that prophetic expression is unimaginative. The opposite. A healthy imagination is the faculty whereby we form a relationship with anyone or anything that is not fully known to us. The faculty whereby we form a relationship with anyone or anything not fully known to us. That includes just about everything, doesn't it? Certainly everything of religious significance. Certainly God. Walter Brueggemann, beginning with his now classic book, Prophetic Imagination, written in 1978, Walter Brueggemann has consistently reminded us that healthy exercises of the imagination, including poetic exercises of the imagination, these are crucial if our minds and our societies, our culture, are to be conformed to God's will. I note one particular aspect of the concreteness of religious poetry that has importance for our own time. And I've given you a couple of lines in your notes from the New England uh, poet, Mary Oliver, when she says in one of her prose poems, the physicality of the religious poets should not be taken idly. He or she who loves God will look most deeply into his works. He or she who loves God will look most deeply into his works. If your ears are attuned to the language of the Psalms, as Mary Oliver's ears are attuned to the language of the Psalms, then you know that the reference to God's works is a reference to the created order. Elohim, the works of God's hands. And so this brings me to the second aspect of the prophetic perspective which I wish to highlight. Namely, the prophetic witness to the integrity or conversely the disintegration and suffering of creation. And consequently, the prophetic demand that our material and economic integrity be evidenced in the lives of human creatures. Integrity requires that we consciously, integrity of this kind in our time, I should maybe specify that, requires that we consciously engage in the work of integration. Because we live in a culture that imagines that our spiritual lives can be separated from our material and economic lives. The, this is, as you know, this is an ancient supposition. In the ancient world, it was called Gnosticism. In the modern world, it's called industrialization. Um, and it is the delusion, again, of the separate separability between our material lives and our spiritual lives. Gnosticism, of course, is one of the first heresies denounced by the church. Heresies are only important to denounce because they are always with us, okay? So we have to keep identifying them over and over again. Um, but this is distinctly not a scriptural way of thinking about things. And many places in scripture make that integration between our spiritual lives and our material economic lives. Oddly, as far as I can tell, this aspect of prophetic poetry has not received a great deal of attention until recently. One example of the integration, I take it uh, 
from Amos, although almost at random from Amos, but Amos is the earliest of the so-called writing prophets. And in chapter four, he is pointing to the economic dimensions of creation or the, the economic dimensions of the violation of creation. So in chapter four, and I'm just going to briefly outline for you what happens in that chapter. Amos moves smoothly from an accusation of economic oppression aimed at Pachrota Bashan, the cows of Bashan, the absentee landowners, in verse 1, moves on then to an indictment of insincere worship, come to Bethel and transgress, to Gilgal and transgress some more, that's verse 4. Then he points to the recent collapse of the economy. I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities, famine. Um, that's verse 6. Then the disastrous results of climate change. I withheld the rain from you when there were still three months to harvest. And on top of that, there has been military disaster. Amos does not give us the freedom to imagine that our spirituality can be separated from our religious li that our spirituality can be separated from our economic lives, and that either of those can be separated from the events that we see happening in the what we would call the natural order. And that is because these things cannot be separated because everything on heaven and earth is ultimately to be referred to the one who forms the mountains and creates the wind, who tells a person what he is thinking, who makes dawn darkness and strides on the heights of the earth. The Lord God of hosts is his name. Chapter 4, verse 12 of Amos. The prophets witness to the suffering of creation. I think especially of Jeremiah, of Isaiah, of Joel, of John, of Patmos. All of them and more prophets see that creation suffers due to human sin. Creation suffers due to human sin. And creation holds that in common, then, with God and with the poor and vulnerable amongst the human population. They all suffer due to human sin. Sally McFaig, in her Body of God, speaks of nature as the new poor in the 20th century. But the prophets are already sensing that vulnerability of creation and witnessing to it, witnessing to the suffering of creation at the very same time as they themselves suffer as part of creation. When there is a drought in Israel and Judah, surely Amos and Jeremiah are thirsty. The only difference between Amos and Jeremiah and their fellow Israelites is that the prophets are clear about why creation is suffering, and they and so many other innocent creatures along with creation as a whole, along with the earth itself. Here I have arrived at my third point, namely prophetic participation in the suffering of the vulnerable within the created or political order and also prophetic witness to the suffering of God. The prophet suffers wittingly, if not willingly, conscious that the suffering results from violations of the covenantal structure of reality. The key point here is that covenant is not a two-way relationship, but a three-way relationship. And I've given you 
this little diagram here showing the covenantal triangle that links God, humanity, and non-human creation. So the prophet, prophet suffers as both a part of creation and as the servant of God. The servant of God who feels and articulates God's pain. My debt to Abraham Joshua Heschel and his lyrical study of the pathos, the pain and suffering of God, um, is evident here. It seems to me that within Hebrew scripture at least, maybe the Bible as a whole, Jeremiah is the most articulate in expressing his own participation in this triangulated suffering between God, humanity, and the non-human creatures. I'm thinking of Jeremiah's so-called laments. Sometimes he speaks for the land in its suffering. Sometimes he speaks for God in God's suffering. And at any given moment, you may not be sure when someone cries out in pain in the book of Jeremiah, you may not be sure who that someone is. It could be God, it could be the land, it could be the prophet himself. That ambiguity or overlap of identities among those who suffer may help Christians make sense of a strange idea that we encounter in the Pauline tradition, namely that the idea that part of the church's witness is to complete Christ's sufferings even in our own bodies. I'm citing the first chapter of Colossians, verse 24, that we make up the sufferings of Christ in our own bodies in the body of the church. This idea, Colossians, of course, is um, not by everyone attributed to Paul, but that idea appears several places in Paul's undisputed letters. Another example is Thessalonians, where Paul asserts that persecutions are part of what Christians are destined for. Persecutions are what make Christians worthy of God's kingdom. So repeatedly, Paul is exhorting his followers and, more importantly, the followers of Christ to encourage one another, to rejoice always. I'm working my way through 2 Thessalonians here. Rejoice always. And in conjunction with this teaching about rejoicing in persecution, he says an interesting thing. Do not despise prophecies but rather exercise discernment. Test everything, Paul says. He would seem to be implying that there is a more than casual expression, it's a more than casual connection between suffering on the one hand and prophetic discernment on the other. Again, that connection between suffering and prophetic discernment is, I think, not often explored in the mainstream North American pulpit. I have neither the knowledge uh, nor the experience to parse that syntax of suffering and discernment as carefully as it deserves. But for a start, here is a perceptive comment from Pope Benedict XVI, in a sermon entitled, Who is Paul? What does he say to me? I've given you a few lines of it in your notes. This was a uh, sermon that the Pope gave on the opening vespers of the feast of St. Peter and Paul in 2008. In a world, he's drawing the connection here, I think, between suffering and, and prophetic discernment. In a world in which falsehood is powerful, the truth is paid for with suffering. The one who desires to avoid suffering cannot be a servant of truth and thus a servant of faith. <laughs>
In a world in which falsehood is powerful, the truth is paid for with suffering. The prophet accepts suffering as the necessary cost of bearing true witness for God. But that does not mean that the prophet is cheerful about it, nor does it mean that the prophet is a doormat for God. I think of my Haitian student, Regine, as she led prayers a week or so ago in the chapel at Duke Divinity School, saying, Well, God, here we are, with tears streaming down our face. Well, God, here we are, saying yes to you because we have nothing else to say. Well, God, here we are, bearing before you Haiti and Sudan. There is a kinship between Regine's prayer and Jeremiah's laments. Both are informed by hard-pressed love and loyalty to God, and also by an element of protest. And this brings me to my fourth point. The prophet as the trusted friend of God, entrusted with a ministry of protest, prayer, healing, and reconciliation. Part of the prophetic role is to intercede with God, to turn back divine judgment or anger, to plead for mercy. Here I'm thinking, and I perhaps forgot to put it. No, I did put it in your notes. The brilliant study by Yochanan Mufs, who will stand in the breach of study of prophetic intercession. The Bible suggests that God wants someone to mitigate, mitigate God's just anger. This would seem to begin already with Abraham in Genesis 20, uh, when he intercedes uh, for Abimelech, and to, who has taken Sarah into his harem. And so Abraham prays uh, to open up the wombs again in the royal um, household. But it becomes this role of the prophet interceding for God and standing against ju God's just anger becomes even clearer again the book of Amos, the earliest of the prophetic writings. And there we learn in chapter 3 of Amos that the role of the prophet is to be God's trusted servant. The Lord does nothing unless he has revealed his counsel to his servants, the prophets. So Amos is rightly emboldened by God's trust in the prophets. Amos is emboldened enough to protest when God shows him the locust swarm that is about to devour the sprouting crops. And I said, I'm, um, I'm in chapter 7 of Amos, and I said, Lord God, forgive. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. So God relents. The prophetic protest on Israel's behalf is successful. Twice it is successful. God changes God's mind and says, I will not do it. But then finally the third time God says, that's it. I will not give them another pass. This is not, this in Amos, is not an isolated example of the prophet standing up to God as the loyal opposition appointed by God. And it has an obvious connection with Jesus' work on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. These texts suggest that at moments it is the prophetic willingness to suffer that keep to suffer as part of the people Israel. It is that 
which keeps God from giving up on Israel. I think of Paul saying, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Amos and Jesus offer instances of the prophetic protest on behalf of the guilty. But there is another kind of protest that appears in Hebrew scripture. I'm not sure it appears in the New Testament, but you may think of it afterwards and tell me. Um, and that is the prophetic protest on behalf of the innocent. Okay, we've seen it on behalf of the guilty. Now I'm talking about the prophetic protest on behalf of the innocent. I'm thinking especially of Elijah when he confronts God over the death of the child of the widow, widow of Zarephath. Remember, she gave hospitality to Elijah. She fixed up that little room um, on the top floor of her house. She even gave him the last food. No, sorry, little room on the top floor. That's later on. Okay. Um, but she gave hospitality to Elijah. She even gave him the last food that she had. When her child stops breathing, Elijah immediately cries out and says, Lord my God, would you bring disaster even upon this widow from whom I have, with whom I have found hospitality by killing her son? Would you even do evil against her by killing her son? Elijah refuses to accept this child's death as final. And in response to the prophet's intercession, God restores life to the child. Scripturally, as John Levinson, amongst others, have shown, Elijah's protest is the beginning of the trajectory that climaxes in the Christian Bible in Jesus' death and resurrection, the ultimate prophetic rejection of death as final. The importance of such strategic intercession from the prophet, I propose, is that it keeps the covenant relationship intact. Prophetic intercession, since I'm doing so well on time, I'm going to give you a midrash on Elijah before we go on, okay? All right? Okay. It's interesting that the later Elijah, narratively speaking, later on in his story, the later Elijah is criticized in the rabbinic tradition precisely for an occasion of failure to confront God, an occasion where he does not take up the role of intercessor on behalf of the people. The Midrash is building on the verse we all know it. I am extremely zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the Israelites have abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed the prophets with the sword, and I only I am left, and they seek my life. Okay. The rabbis criticize Elijah for tattling on the people instead of defending them before God. Okay. And in the Midrash, God says to Elijah, Think about the people in Damascus. Before you start criticizing my children, you go to Damascus, where they worship 360 gods, one for every day of the lunar year. Go to Damascus, and on one day they celebrate all 360 at once. Go to Damascus on that day and criticize them, and then come back and tell me what you think about my people. Okay? It seems to me that what the Midrash is suggesting here is that strategic intercession from the prophet is what keeps the covenant relationship intact. Prophetic intercession for the guilty keeps God from giving up on Israel. Um, as Amos intercedes for them, as Jesus intercedes for them. But maybe equally, prophetic intercession for the innocent Elijah interceding for the child, maybe that keeps us from giving up on God. God's response to such intercession for the innocent 
is, of course, not always or usually to restore life that has been lost. Although, we can believe it or not, I have friends in the Episcopal Church in Sudan who attest that as recently as last month, they prayed for a young woman who died and her life was restored. God's more usual response, though, as my Sudanese colleagues know as well as we do, God's more usual response is not to restore life, but to suffer with us in the face of loss of life. So the third element I noted here, the prophetic witness to the shared suffering between God and the created order, that is also essential to the continuance of the covenant relationship. Knowing that God suffers when we do, whether our suffering is in guilt or in innocence, knowing that God suffers keeps us from giving up on God. God's justice is not coolly administered. God's authorship of the world is impassioned, involved, and it is costly for God. My fifth and final point, and it is, in a sense, it may be the one most directly applicable to the discussion about faith in a pluralistic world, but I also acknowledge that within the prophetic tradition, at least, this is the most debatable of the five points I am highlighting for you, and that is the prophetic witness to the theological significance of the religiously other and I am suggesting it is potentially a witness of reconciliation. I say this is my most debatable point, not because I'm not sure that there's something to it, but because it is debated within the prophetic corpus itself. The status of Israel vis-a-vis -vis its neighbors, its enemies, uh, the status of Israel vis-a-vis -vis those who are religiously other than Israel itself. So, for example, an, an example of this debate, we have on the one hand multiple prophetic books which have a section which scholars call the oracles against the nations, you know, usually a series of chapters that take down Tyre, Damascus, you know, you name it, um, Babylon, Egypt, and so on. Okay. Declaring that all of these enemies of Israel will get theirs. Right. These oracles against the nations in the Christian Bible reach their apogee, in a sense, in Revelation against um, the great Babylon, which is Rome, of course. The book of Nahum is in its entirety an oracle against the nation of Assyria, an oracle predicting the downfall of Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, the great destroyer. But within the prophetic corpus, the counter witness to Nahum is Jonah, who is called to preach the Ninevites to repentance, as you know. And he doesn't want to do it. He protests, not just against the job, but Jonah protests against the character of God. Jonah cites the great st creedal statement from Exodus 32. This is after the Ninevites have repented and God um, has turned back the destruction from them. And Jonah says, this is why, exactly why I didn't want to do this because I knew you were a God merciful and gracious, abounding in covenant love. So Jonah is citing scripture against God. But the irony is that we as readers of scripture hear it as condemning Jonah in his hard-heartedness. A further irony is that Jonah, who preaches repentance against his will, is probably the most successful of the preachers of repentance in the Bible. He's certainly the only one who gets a whole nation to turn around. Okay. There are 
numerous other examples. Let me just highlight uh, another one of them. I won't go into it in detail. Not in the, um, not in latter prophets, uh, but in former prophets, the stories of the prophets in what um, scholars, many of them call the Deuteronomistic history, so Joshua through Kings. Um, I think that, that in those historical narratives, the prophetic witness offers significant resources for a positive evaluation of the outsider. Uh, I'm thinking of the fact that Rahab, the quintessential Canaanite whore, okay? I mean, in everything that Israel says Canaanites do, Rahab represents in her own person. She is infinitely preferable to the Israelites, um, to the spies who, the Israelite spies who were sent to check out the land. And of course, the first place that they check out is the brothel in the wall in Jericho. And then they go hide under the flax up on the roof. Um, and Rahab is, in fact, the first person to declare faith in the God who created heaven and earth and brought Israel out of Egypt in the promised land. Okay. Rahab is infinitely preferable to the Israelites, especially she is to be um, preferred to Achan, the Ben Kami, Ben Judah. So he's got about he's got an incredible pedigree of about four generations. The quintessential Israelite who steals from the ban, remember the which is to be devoted to God. Again, I think about the later in Joshua the Gibeonites who lie and cheat their way into the covenant and become hewers of wood and drawers of water to get into the covenant where Israel is doing everything it can to get out of the covenant with God. So at any rate, one might work with those things as I have um, in something I haven't cited in your notes, so it doesn't make any difference. Okay. Um, all right. Um, and... One more instance of a conflicted tradition about this would be Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 29, a highlight in terms of Israel, Israel's uh, attitude toward the other. Um, in Jeremiah's letter to the exiles saying, Yeshu et shalom ha'ir. Seek the shalom, the welfare, the well-being of the city to which I have exiled you, for in it shalom is your shalom. Uh, that's chapter 29 of Jeremiah. Chapter 51 of Jeremiah begins with God saying, Look, I am awakening against Babylon a ruach mashchit, a destroying spirit, and then you have about 60 verses of destruction decreed against Babylon. Obviously, there's a very active debate within the prophetic tradition about the status of the religiously other. To conclude, taken together, I think these four or five aspects of the prophetic work and witness represented within the Bible have this effect. We see that prophetic speech, speech and action are aimed at lowering the level of abstraction on the covenantal nature of reality. Lowering the level of abstraction on the covenantal nature of reality. Pro pro prophetic speaking is directed wholly to making it impossible for us to see God as an abstraction and equally impossible to take an abstract view of our own covenantal commitments to God, neighbor, and creation. Perhaps working in that non-abstract mode of viewing scripture in, and the world is what it means to be prophetic interpreters in the 21st century. Thank you. I would be very interested in your comments and your questions. Yes. <laughs>
thank you. And it's, I think I want to clarify that when I am, I was talking about, when I was speaking about Robert Loth and, and things that we would set as prophet, as poetic texts in short lines, okay, uh, breath units. But I think for the purposes of interpretation, everything I have said about the interpretation of prophetic poetry applies also to biblical prose. Because I'm really talking about its concreteness. I'm talking about the fact that every, that no word is wasted. Uh, no image is wasted. Um, no metaphor is wasted. I mean, I'm thinking, and this is this is texts that appear in narrative, not in poetic lines. Um, there was a debate amongst some of my colleagues recently um, about someone was presenting on the importance of gardening um, and caring for the earth, my colleague Norman Wurzba. And two New Testament scholars objected and said, gardening is a metaphor in the Bible. And he said, well, is food a metaphor? Um, I mean, even if it is a metaphor, does a metaphor not connect to the way we, you know, the way we lead our lives? Of course. I mean, we know in our common speech, we own, you know, we use the phrases we use over and over again metaphorically are things that connect to the core realities in our daily existence. So, I guess my point is, Amy, that the kinds of tools that we learned in 10th grade to apply to poetry, those are the kinds of tools you need to apply when you're reading the text. You just pay attention to every word, assume it's deliberate, and that the writer wasn't stupid. <laughs> and, you know, and, let, and let your senses get engaged in responding to that. Does that make sense? And I think there are plenty of those in the lectionary, everything. In the back, and then um, Mr. Gerber. Okay. I think that I do not see um, a distinction. I, I would see the concrete as being fully consonant with speaking about the highest realities. I was trying to show that in the way I, I dealt with Isaiah 6. I do think, though, that there would be a difference between the concrete and dealing with surface realities. And I think if you get beneath the surface, if you, as my spiritual director says, manage to get to ground, well then, you will find any number of points of contact between ground and any, any number of particular instances will enable you to make contact with that. Does that make sense? And yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I think analogy, I mean, certainly in the work that I have been doing on scripture, culture, and agriculture, and I'm trying to create a conversation there between the biblical text, specifically Hebrew scripture, and um, 21st century agriculture. I can only do that by way of analogy. And that's a way of thinking that I believe I have learned from rabbinic thought, which habitually thinks in terms of analogy. At least that would be my understanding. You may have more to say about that um, later on. If I make that. But, um, and I also want to say that I don't think 
I think at times we need to speak in the abstract. You know, we need, there is a value to abstractions, to principles, to pulling back for a moment. But then you need to be able to go back into the concrete. It's the, it is making our religious lives a permanent immaterial abstraction, which is what I'm trying to speak against. Thank you. And I just need to, may I take one more question? Okay, thank you, Mr. Gogan. Um, I have not made this particular, uh, although I've, uh, I have spoken, well, let me tell you two stories from Sudan. That's a better way to answer it. Um, a few years ago, my, um, the bishop with whom I work in Sudan asked me to teach the students at the theological college where I work. He asked me to teach me teach them Exodus and Leviticus because I was his student a number of I was his teacher a number of years ago and I remember he said at the time we live in the Old Testament you know we live in these texts we live in an agrarian village culture kinship based culture so he said you know Exodus and Leviticus are my favorite poets do that you know so the first day of class I thought as you may know, the Anglican Communion is riven over the issue of sexuality. And I, we'd done a, a week on Exodus, and I was going in for the first day of class on Leviticus, and I thought, I was sort of figuring, well, I probably need to take on the subject of sexuality. And as I walked through the door of the classroom, I looked at the students, and it suddenly occurred to me that Leviticus begins with ch seven chapters on sacrifice. And I said... I bet I'm the only person in this room who knows absolutely nothing about the practice of sacrifice. And I went, well, I guess. <laughs> um, and so that's where we started. And it put everything else in a very different context when we began with something they understood and I didn't, which is why Leviticus begins with seven detailed chapters on sacrifice. So that's one example. Um, another example would be from the books of the prophets, and with this I will end. Um, chapter 18 of the book of Isaiah speaks about a people tall and smooth, um, feared in war, um, in the land beyond where the, rivers where the river divides, which is to say south of Khartoum, uh, where the blue and the white Nile converge in Khartoum. So they're speaking about the peoples of the Upper Nile. Well, that's where I teach in Upper Nile State in Sudan. And, and that, as far as we know, that's the furthest south anybody in ancient Israel knew existed. Well, when you people are speaking of a people tall, dark, and smooth, feared in war, and I'm teaching Dinka and Nua, whose average height is 6'6 six, six and 6'8, six, you know, I think we got there. Um, and for them, their existence is acknowledged and they're eventually turning to worship God, the God of Israel, is prophesied in the book of Isaiah. So that is the context in which they hear all of this. Uh, so it has an enormous immediacy to them. Anyway, I could go on and on. Thank you. Our thanks to Dr. Davis for getting us, I think, a good start in thinking about pr prophecy and helping us think about what it means for us. So um, our schedule is such that I think we can start our next session at 11.15 rather than 11.30, as the program says. So we have a few minutes for a break. The men's room is right out the hall here on the th third floor, ladies one floor down. Try to be back here by 11.15. Thank you very much. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School. Thank you.